as you can see, and no doubt here in the background, I'm out standing beside the chicken coop here, uh, getting ready to record the last little clip for this video, which will show the Chanticleer chicks. <laughs> and that's Prince Leah. We'll show the Chanticleer chicks, which are six weeks old today. Other than that, on this video, I guess I have harvested my grapes and made grape jelly. Uh, I'll show you. I show you the uh, lacto-fermented dill pickles after they finished. Taste one of them for you. And I've harvested the first of my beans and uh, canned the uh, runner beans, the uh, pole beans. So that's just about it for this little video. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm about to find out how many grapes there are on this vine. They're hidden everywhere behind leaves, but. They appear to be, for the most part, ripe, so I'm going to see if I can't get enough to uh, make a small batch, anyway, of grape jelly. Uh, they're not actually a Concord grape, but they're in the same family as a Concord grape. Uh, the variety, I guess I've said many times in the past, is Beta. It's a slipskin grape like Concords are, and I've tasted a few here. They taste to me just like a Concord, so we'll see what we get here and uh, see if we can make some grape jelly. There are lots of them there, and I don't know, I guess I'm showing you those. They're not very big, and the individual clusters are not very big, but there are plenty. So, we'll finish up and put them in here, and I'll show you what I get when I finish. Not a very large harvest. <laughs> I found a recipe uh, for grape jelly online that calls for a cup of sugar, for every cup of juice so I'm hoping I get at least a cup of juice out of these it might look like a lot so I'll put my hand in there to show you there isn't a great deal a lot of clusters but they the grapes didn't uh, get very large I've got to do some more research I guess on the beta grape to see if that's as big as they're supposed to get or do I have hopes when the vines get more mature that they will be larger grapes or maybe I'm not doing a good job of pruning? Anyway, we'll see what happens here with grape jelly production. Well, that's the entire harvest. <laughs> I didn't measure, see how many cups of it are there, but not a great deal. The instructions say to add half a cup of water and then to mash them slightly. It has to do with two hands because now I guess they're just to break the skin, not to completely pulverize them. Then it goes on the stove uh, until it comes to a boil. And you turn it back and simmer it until they've really softened up and most of the juices are out. And after that it goes in a strainer bag, a jelly bag, to uh, drain the juice out ready for the final phase to a full boil and now you're supposed to let it simmer for a while covered but it certainly changed its color it started out almost clear and now it's definitely that wonderful sort of concord grape color and there's a fair amount of juice developing there i might get enough for to try for a couple of cups i guess but anyway, i'll let it simmer for a bit it says and Keep checking it so that it doesn't stick to the bottom before it goes in the jelly bag. It's finished boiling and I've put it in a jelly bag. I don't know, it's so dark down in there. You probably can't see it dripping, but it is dripping. And it says to let it drip for two to three hours. And I think that's meant for when you have a lot more grapes than I had. But anyway, I'll let it drip until it stops dripping. And well, I think this at least is in excess of a cup of juice there already. So I may get a few small jelly jars out of this. Well, I got a cup and a half of the grape juice and it finished dripping finely. And it says to add equal portions of sugar. So I have a cup and a half of sugar here to add. And also says to bring it to a full boil and then try to add the sugar gradually so that it doesn't come off the boil. 
and it gives you instructions as to when a jelly forms, this internet recipe that I found, uh, according to how the uh, liquid comes off the back of a spoon, if it runs off quickly or if it drips off slowly after it has started to thicken. I'm going to use that method, but I'm also going to use the method that uh, I've been using lately, making jams, and that's with the candy thermometer. Once this comes to 104 degrees uh, Celsius, or 220 degrees Fahrenheit, that is supposed to indicate when it is turned to a jelly. So I think that's what I will follow more than how it cascades off a spoon. Anyway, I won't force you to watch this long process. Go back and see how many little jelly jars I get out of a cup and a half of uh, juice and a cup and a half of sugar. Well, the yield was two jam jars, two uh, 250 milliliter jam jars. They're different shape, but they each hold the same amount. And I'm quite sure that it uh, worked and is going to turn into a jelly. I'm not going to bother the doing the hot water bath canning thing. I've, the stuff was still boiling hot when I put it in the jars, so I'm just waiting to hear those click and seal, and that will be good enough. But um, the part that was remaining on the sides and bottoms of the saucepan gelled almost immediately, so I'm confident that this will set up into a, a nice grape jelly. Not exactly a large harvest, but I'm sure I'll enjoy it. Well, if you watched my previous video, these are the two jars of uh, lacto-fermented dill pickles that have been in the basement doing their fermentation for five days, and I'm now ready to put them in the refrigerator. I haven't tried one yet, but I'm going to in just a second here. Um, they will continue to improve their flavor under refrigeration, but as I mentioned in the other video, after five days you start to get a cloudy brine um, because yeast starts to form so I like the nice clear brine so I stop mine at five days I have two different pickle meisters bought on two different occasions um, I've removed the airlocks and whatever this one has a solid lid that with no hole in it that came to put on after you've removed the airlock and then the one bought later on has a rubber stopper that you put in the top where the airlock used to be. I guess they both work just as well, but I prefer this, the older variety. Anyway, let's give these a try and see if they've developed much flavor yet. Mm. Very good. Not too strong yet, but it will continue to enhance as time goes on here. I think it's got a nice crunch, and I hope that's the part that stays. Anyway, there they are, ready to go in the refrigerator. Two large jars, and yes, they do take up a lot of room in the refrigerator, but it gave me a good opportunity to go through the refrigerator and remove all those jars that had a little bit of some mystery product left in the bottom, <laughs> some of which that was growing a strange culture. So now I do have lots of room to put these in the fridge. Well, what you're looking at in this strange shot is the beginnings of a wasp's nest, uh, these paper wasp ones that build the nest that look like they're built out of paper. I first discovered that nest last spring, and it was exactly that size when I discovered it. Um, hard to tell, I guess, from this close-up shot of it, but that's oh, not much more than two inches across and maybe two inches deep. For some reason, the wasps decided to move on. Well, I think I just discovered where they moved to, so let me take you and show you. Well, I'm not going to go over in and measure that one. <laughs> As you can see, there are wasps coming and going out of it. And this is only about, uh, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 feet from the cabin, very edge of the trees here anyway. I don't really know if it's the same wasp that decided this was a better location and, and moved or why the other little nest was actually abandoned. But uh, if you believe some of the folklore that goes along with these things, supposedly the height that they are from the ground determines how bad the winter is going to be. And this one I would estimate is about five feet off the ground, which is not very high at all. I've seen them at the top of very tall trees, so uh, that's any indication at all we're supposed to be getting a mild winter with not very much snow. 
think we'll get whatever we get and the wasp nest won't have anything to do with it but isn't that a thing of of beauty it's amazing how they they make that i really don't understand how they make it they've chewed up something a bark or whatever and made this paper like substance i know that they don't stay in that in the winter time uh, later in the fall you can collect those quite safely there's no wasps left in them the uh, uh, bred females in the fall the ones that have already made it uh, go off in a solitary way and find some crevice somewhere where they hibernate for the winter and come back out and uh, start one of these again in the spring and build up the colony again. But That one's quite active. There are wasps coming and going constantly. And I don't understand if they're pollinators or not, so anybody knows for sure, you can leave a comment down below here. I don't know if these are beneficial to my garden or not, but they're not harming me, so I won't harm them. Well, it's August 30th, and this is my first picking of the whole beans for canning anyway. I've had a few that I've eaten, cooked and eaten fresh, and I've given a few to friends. Um, that is sitting on the scales, but the shadow that it casts makes it impossible to video the reading. But that is five pounds, 14 ounces of beans, or two and two thirds kilograms. I'm going to can them, and I'll show you the how many jars I get at the end. I won't uh, give you the process for canning them uh, because it varies depending on your pressure canner. Um, these are it's a, a low acid canning process so it has to be done in a pressure canner, canner for safety reasons and the instructions with different size canners are are, are different so I, I won't go into that. Um, basically all that goes in each jar is cut up beans, half a teaspoon of canning salt, uh, not table salt because the iodine in table salt will turn your canning goods brown and then you fill it with water and it's canned under pressure according to the instructions with your canner so I'll give you a look at uh, how many bottles I get when I'm finished here I guess I didn't say these are Blue Lake uh, pole beans if you've seen my videos previously of my bean tower I had to use uh, a six foot uh, step ladder to get up to the very top and pick the ones on the top of the bean tower. I've just finished cutting them up and I don't uh, cut the tail end off. I leave the little pointy thing. As near as I can tell, there's only the only reason for doing that is people don't like the looks of it, so that doesn't bother me. I don't do that. But I cut the stem end off. Uh, it can be quite tough and there can also be a bit of the stem left like that one there that I missed and got in the wrong place, I guess. Anyway, that's a nice big bowl full, and I will see how many jars it makes. Well, there are enough beans to do 13 uh, pint or 500 milliliter jars, and I guess I said earlier that I put salt. I put a half a teaspoon of salt uh, in a pint or 500 milliliter jar, but that's entirely optional. If you have issues with sodium, you can use less or none at all. It isn't there for preservative, it's just there to enhance flavor. And now I have to find out if these will fit in the canner. I know you can put a double layer in this pressure canner of mine, I just can't remember how many jars that is, so I'll find out in a minute if I can put 13 in there or not. Well, they all fit in there, and there's room for actually maybe three more jars, I guess. Hopefully they'll all come out in one piece, no broken jars. I, what I wanted to say a little bit earlier and forgot to is that I pack the jars as full as you can pack them because they will, the beans will shrink up some in cooking. This is raw packed, and they're going to cook in the canner. Um, see this jar here isn't as full as the rest. That was the, the last jar. I uh, didn't have quite enough to jam pack it full and I didn't go out to the garden to pick any more. So I'll use that one first, I guess. And I don't think I mentioned also that this, uh, this is just an early picking of the beans. There are a lot more out there that aren't up to size and there's a lot of blossoms. So if the weather continues like this for another few weeks, I should be able to do this at least one more time. All 13 jars made it through the canning process. I guess there's one in the back row that you probably can't see. Second in from the left on the back row seems to have lost some of its liquid, so if that doesn't seal properly, I'll eat that one first, I guess. Just now to wait until they completely cool and check to make sure that they all sealed, that the 
covers have sort of become concave, have snapped and gone down. And then they're off to the basement for storage and hopefully to be enjoyed this winter. Little guys are so independent now, it's almost impossible to get a shot with all five of them in it. But I guess four are in that. As you can see, they're really feathering out. Uh, I'm sure there's at least one rooster. There's one that's much bigger than the other four. So I still don't know how many roosters there's the other one coming into. What do you know? We've got all five of them. We've had several wet, rainy days, and I haven't been letting them out on the grass because I don't want to stand around outside in the rain. But uh, I've been letting them out in the hen yard. And all the other hens, if it rains, they go inside. These little guys seem to like it, except for the absolute downpours. A gentle rain doesn't seem to bother them at all. And the poor little <laughs> bandy hen there, she feels obligated to stay out with them in the rain. So, I know that's something unique to the breed or what that might mean anyway thank you very much for watching